Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. My brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, therefore I ask, Bless Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. to God in the highest. Let us pray. O God, who anointed your only begotten Son with the Holy Spirit and made him Christ and Lord, graciously grant that being made sharers in his consecration, we may bear witness to your redemption in the world through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me, 
because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to announce a year of favor from the Lord and a day of vindication by our God, to comfort all who mourn, to place on those who mourn in Zion a, di a diadem instead of ashes, to give them oil of gladness in place of mourning, a glorious mantle instead of a listless spirit. You yourselves shall be named priests of the Lord, ministers of our God, you shall be called. I will give them their recompense faithfully, a lasting covenant I will make with them. Their descendants shall be renowned among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them as a race the Lord has blessed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the book of Revelation. Jesus Christ is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, who has made us into a kingdom, priests for his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever 
and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming amid the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the peoples of the earth will lament him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came to Nazareth where he had grown up, and went according to his custom into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read and was handed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the passage where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. Rolling up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue looked intently at him. He said to them, Today, the scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. At this solemn mass of chrism, the priests unite with their bishop in renewing our promises of a priestly commitment to serve God's people. We do this tonight in your presence, our deacons, our religious, our laity, throughout our diocese. You who support us in so many ways, in good times and in times so trying. And whether those among us hold a particular title in their parishes, 
We also recognize the countless numbers of volunteers throughout our whole diocese who contribute so much in so many ways and are a true support to my brother priests and to me. Thank you again and yet again. Observing then this celebration uniting the priesthood and the Eucharist of the Last Supper with the ministries represented in the holy oils to be blessed, I ask your kind indulgence to address some words to our priests. These last several years have painfully impacted the faithful and our lives as priests as we see the wounds and scars the innocent have suffered by some who once served among us. But we commend all to the mercy of God. We approach the altar of the Lord as we do at all masses, pleading for the Lord's mercy and an abundance of his compassion. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. So proclaimed Jesus, reading from the scroll upon which were written the words of the prophet Isaiah. This will be his mission entrusted by the Father. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, who has made us into a kingdom, priests for his God and Father. And it will be the mission of his apostles, disciples, and priests down through the ages. But it was, is, and forever will be until the end of time a difficult mission in the shadow of Golgotha, but a mission also basking in the light of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the 10th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, Jesus spared no words and lacked no clarity in presenting to the apostles the challenges that they would encounter which would lead them, save for the beloved disciple John, to their own Golgotha. He tells them, I am sending you as lambs in the midst of wolves. When one reads the New Testament, it quickly becomes so very apparent that Jesus, rich in mercy, at the same time in his mercy and love for us, speaks in a direct, clear, and decisive manner. He does not speak to please the ear, to be politically correct for the times in which he walked this earth, to curry favor with the powerful for personal gain. No, he speaks to proclaim the truth. He defines reality and underlines the challenges his words present. Jesus does not spare even his own disciples the sacrifices that will be demanded of them in service to the proclamation of the gospel. Jesus wants them to understand that some, and sometimes many, will reject what they have to say and maybe even become hostile toward them. How well we know the hosannas of Palm Sunday will become the cries at Golgotha, crucify him. Holy Scripture itself tells us they found him too much to take. For after he had cured the sick, forgave sinners, even called the dead back to life, when he began to speak about the Eucharist, his real presence, his body and his blood given for them, they found him too much to take. So it was when Jesus walked this earth, and so it is now. Observe the daily news accounts and how quickly one realizes the Christian message does not find a home 
sadly, in many places. Perhaps the greatest obstacle that this message presents to society is its command that we should love one another. We should be concerned for the other person. We should be not only sympathetic but empathetic toward the hurts and the sufferings of others. But it is a constant struggle within our nature to forget, our, forget ourselves and look always out for the others. And unless we believe, really believe in Jesus and in what he has to say, this struggle never will be won. This life becomes the only life, an eternal life, becomes a myth, certainly not a goal to be sought after. Such an approach has no room for sin, no need for forgiveness, and one does as one wishes. Selfishness becomes the primary motivating force, and we witness, sadly, even in silence and with fear, and and fear of retribution, the attack upon the child of the womb, the abandonment of those in troubled pregnancies left so very alone with the father nowhere to be found, and the attempts to eradicate the old and the disabled because their material contributions are no longer existent, and the poor remain alone and unwanted rashly judged without knowing what brought this burden upon them. What do we say in the face of governments that talk and talk and filibuster while the impoverished remain cemented in their desolate condition and wars rage on and destroy innocent life? What do we say? With what force like Jesus, do we confront these ills of our own society. And the whole spectrum of life in between creates a diminished and hurt person, scarred by violence, neglect, ridicule, anger, and self-indulgence. In short, unless the voice of Jesus is heard, we become a society without God. Who then would possibly dare to preach about the sanctity of all life, the commandments of God, the need for just and rational laws, both legal and moral, the call of each person to perfection, the cultivation of the virtues of fidelity, loyalty, purity, and wonder and awe in the presence of God? To do so is to be a lamb in the midst of wolves. But as the disciples in today's gospel accepted the challenge, so do we, his priests. Why is that? Because, my brothers, there is no better way. When we encounter the triumph of evil, it is not because God's law has failed, but rather it is because humanity has failed to keep his law and the supreme law of charity, thus creating the arenas of wolves that trample each other only to get ahead. Over the 2,000-year history of the church, she has continued to preach the Lord's message, a message which has survived in every different cycle and period of civilization because it is the truth. And the wise person never surrenders the truth, but rather embraces the truth. We worship here tonight priests and God's wonderful laity, with the ordained and religious, all carrying our own crosses, because we are committed to the Lord and to what he has to say. We are here because we have not surrendered or given up, we have not quit, but firmly do we uphold and adhere to the message that comes to us from Holy Scripture through the words of our Savior Jesus Christ, 
and foretold in the Old Testament. Despite contrary voices, we assert the sanctity of all life and the rule of the Lord who has created us. Whether ordained or not ordained, young or old, parents, students, professionals, laborers, whatever our state in life, we believe we do have something to say to others. We speak to them about what is in our mind and in our heart, our love for Jesus Christ and our Catholic faith, which has nurtured this love, a faith rooted in Christ, which is so very real to us. And we are not about to be forced or pressured into abandoning it by hostile voices who tell us, freedom is to do as we please, not as God pleases. The great saints and martyrs of the church did not surrender, but firmly committed, were committed followers of Jesus and sealed that commitment with their own blood. In our own time, our Holy Fathers, St. John Paul II, Benedict XVI of beloved memory, and now our Holy Father, Pope Francis, have dared to speak the truth, to proclaim freedom in the lands oppressed by dictators and unjust rulers, to challenge young people to live lives that are wholesome and pure, while so many other contemporary mediums present aberrations of every kind. Our Holy Fathers have dared to speak of peace and unity where hatred has divided and destroyed peoples. These vicars of Christ have proclaimed that God continues through his church to proclaim with faith, enthusiasm, and courage the message of the lambs, even in the most hostile of circumstances. These supreme shepherds of souls have been bearers of true hope, recalling the words of the prophet Isaiah. Then the wolf will be the guest of the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion shall browse together, with a little child to guide them. Here is exemplified the patience and the endurance of Jesus, who from the cross petitioned his heavenly Father. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Always remember, as some have said so beautifully, it was not the nails that held Jesus to the cross. It was his love for us. Jesus did not run away from the consequences of his words and deeds, and this commitment has inspired millions upon millions, beginning at Golgotha and now marching forward in the third millennium. As his priests, despite the heartaches, difficulties, and crosses that might be in our own lives, let us recall those final words of Dante's Paradiso, God is the love that moves the sun and the other stars. It is this love that envelops us in our priestly ministry. So we do go on, walking with our people, not simply accompanying them without a destination, but walking with them to God through his Son, Jesus Christ. Benedict the Sixteenth taught us in these words, we can only encounter God by walking after Jesus. The only way we can see him is by following Jesus. The way that God is seen in this world is by following Christ. Seeing is going, is being on the way for our whole life toward the living God whereby Jesus Christ, by the entire way that he walked, especially by the paschal mystery of his suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension, presents us with the itinerary. My dear brother priests, 
my co-workers in the ministry. This is the path we must pave for our people, the itinerary which leads to eternal life. Ah, again that phrase, eternal life a reality that evokes mystery, but also non-belief. As I began, so many live as if this is the only life. Eternal life becomes a fantasy in order to escape the responsibilities of life, a catchphrase to avoid an explanation of the faith or entering into the troubled hearts of our people. In our own hearts, Dear priests, faithful collaborators, do we truly believe in eternal life, that God will indeed judge us, that we are not free agents, but we act in persona Christi, in the person of Christ? Thus we must be Christ in mind, heart, and soul. Our prayers are replete with petitioning God to lead us to eternal life. At one's more senior age, eternal life truly becomes more visible on the horizon of life. And I do ask even myself, has eternal life just become words of a phrase, empty words, or do I pronounce them not just by my lips, but by my mind and my heart. I offer these words of Henry Cardinal de Lubick. Belief in eternity does not tear us away from the present, as we are sometimes told, in order to make us lost in dreams. It works just the other way around. It is rather by disregarding eternity that Christians have disregarded their times. My dear brothers in Christ Jesus, thank you for daring to walk among the suffering, the dejected and the victims of hatred and prejudices, for your courage and for your fidelity to the gospel, and especially to the person of the eternal high priest, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your odd sum, your present, without counting the cost. Thank you for making the journey, for being Simon of Cyrene to your people and leading them, we pray, to the glory of heaven. May our imitation of the Lord truly inspire others and may each of us in our own way make this world just a little better place a place where there are far more lambs and fewer wolves and where even the wolves can become lambs. And we entrust ourselves this day to our Mother Mary, Mother of the clergy, recalling the sublime words Dante put on the lips of the heavenly vision of St. Bernard in his Paradiso. Thou Virgin Mother, daughter of thy son, humble and high beyond all other creature, the limit fixed of the eternal counsel. Thou art the one who such nobility to human nature gave that its creator did not disdain to make himself its creature. We will now come to the time to bless these very oils used in the church's priestly and Episcopal ministries. The oil of the sick to become a safeguard for body, soul, and spirit, asking God to accompany and to heal our sick sisters and brothers from all pain, all infirmity, and all sickness. The oil of catechumens to grant courage to the catechumens who will be anointed with it in preparation for their baptism, the oil of holy chrism to become a sacred sign of perfect salvation and life for those to be made new in the spiritual waters of baptism and sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit at confirmation. 
those ordained to the priesthood and episcopacy, are anointed with this charism for service in humility to God's people, in imitation of the eternal high priest, Jesus Christ, from whose holy name it has received the name Chrism. These oils, blessed within this Eucharistic sacrifice, underline the ministerial nature of the priesthood, a call to serve, a call to imitate the master, to don the apron as he did when he washed the feet of his priests and told them to do likewise. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Renewal of priestly promises, answering to the following with the words, I am. Beloved sons, on the anniversary of that day when Christ our Lord conferred his priesthood on his apostles and on us, are you resolved to renew in the presence of your bishop and God's people the promises you once made? Are you resolved to be more united with the Lord Jesus and more closely conformed to him, denying yourselves and confirming those promises about sacred duties towards Christ's church, which, prompted by love of him, you willingly and joyfully pledged on the day of your priestly ordination? Amen. Are you resolved to be faithful stewards of the mysteries of God in the Holy Eucharist, and the other liturgical rites, and to discharge faithfully the sacred office of teaching, following Christ the head and shepherd, not seeking any gain, but moved only by zeal for souls. Amen. I now ask God's holy people, are you resolved, dearest sons and daughters, to pray for your priests, that the Lord may pour out his gifts abundantly upon them and keep them faithful as ministers of Christ, the high priest, so that they may lead you to him who is the source of our salvation. And pray also for me, that I may be faithful to the apostolic office entrusted to me in my lowliness, and that in your midst I may be made day by day a living and more perfect image of Christ the priest, the good shepherd, the teacher, and the servant of all. May the Lord keep us all in his charity and lead us, all of us, shepherds and flock, to eternal life. Amen. Amen.
the balsam. The oil of catechumens. The oil of the sick. The oil for holy chrism. O oh God, Father of all consolation, who will to heal the infirmities of the weak through your Son, listen favorably to the prayer of faith. Send forth from the heavens, we pray, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, upon this oil in all its richness, which you have graciously brought forth from the verdant tree to restore the body, so that by your holy blessing. Everyone anointed with this oil as a safeguard for body, soul, and spirit may be freed from all pain, all infirmity, and all sickness. May your holy oil, O Lord, be blessed by you for our sake, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. Amen. O oh God, strength and protection of your people, who have made the oil you created a sign of strength, graciously bless this oil and grant courage to the catechumens who will be anointed with it so that, receiving divine wisdom and power, they may understand more deeply the gospel of your Christ. They may undertake with a generous heart the labors of the Christian life, and, made worthy of adoption as your sons and daughters, they may rejoice to be born anew and to live in your church through Christ our Lord. Let us pray, dear brothers and sisters, to God the Father Almighty, that he bless and sanctify this oil, so that all who are outwardly anointed with it may be inwardly conformed and come to share in eternal salvation. O oh God, author of all growth and spiritual progress, receive in your goodness the grateful homage that the Church joyfully offers to you through our voice. For in the beginning you commanded the earth to bring forth fruit-bearing trees, among which olive trees would arise as providers of this most rich oil, so that their fruit might serve for sacred chrism. In the spirit of prophecy, David foresaw the sacraments of your grace 
and sang of the oil that would gladden our faces. After the world's offenses were washed away by the flood, a dove announced the restoration of peace on earth with the olive branch, foreshadowing the gift to come. In the last days, all this has been clearly revealed when every offense is removed through the waters of baptism. The anointing with this oil causes our faces to be joyful and serene. You also commanded your servant Moses to make his brother Aaron a priest by pouring this oil upon him after he had been washed in water. Still greater dignity was added to this when your son Jesus Christ, our Lord, insisted that he be washed by John in the waters of the Jordan. You sent the Holy Spirit from on high in the likeness of a dove. You declared by the witness of the voice that followed that you were well pleased in him, your only begotten son. And you were seen to confirm clearly what the prophet David had foretold in song, that Christ would be anointed with the oil of gladness above his companions. Therefore, we beseech you, Lord, be pleased to sanctify with your blessing this oil in its richness and to pour into it the strength of the Holy Spirit with the powerful working of your Christ. From his holy name, it has received the name of chrism, and with it you have anointed your priests prophets, kings, and martyrs. May you confirm the chrism you have created as a sacred sign of perfect salvation and life for those to be made new in the spiritual waters of baptism. May those formed into a temple of your majesty by the holiness infused through this anointing and by the cleansing of the stain of their first birth be made fragrant with the innocence of a life pleasing to you. May those anointed with royal, priestly, and prophetic dignity be clothed with the garment of an incorruptible gift in keeping with the sacrament you have established. May this oil be the chrism of salvation for those born again of water and the Holy Spirit, and may it make them partakers of eternal life and sharers of heavenly glory, through Christ our Lord. Amen.
my sisters and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the power of this sacrifice, O Lord, we pray, mercifully wipe away what is old in us and increase in us grace of salvation and newness of life through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your heart. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Amen. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you made your only begotten Son, high priest of the new and eternal covenant. And by your wondrous design, we're pleased to decree that his one priesthood should continue in the church. For Christ not only adorns with a royal priesthood the people he has made his own, but with a brother's kindness, he also chooses men to become sharers in his sacred ministry through the laying on of hands. They are to renew in his name the sacrifice of human redemption, to set before your children the paschal banquet, to lead your holy people in charity, to nourish them with the word and strengthen them with the sacraments. And they give up their lives for you and for the salvation of their brothers and sisters. They strive to be conformed to the image of Christ himself and offer you a constant witness of faith and love. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give you thanks, as in exultation we acclaim. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition to Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to God unite and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant, Francis, our Pope, me, your unworthy servant, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants, the priests and faithful of our Diocese of Rochester, our deacons and our religious, and the many who assist the priests and the pastors with the numerous works of charity, love, and care.
and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offered for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls in hope of health and well-being, in paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true, in communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmos and Damien, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the Blessed Passion, the Resurrection from the Dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord, we, your servants, and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance, and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant, Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar 
receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who those sinners, hope in your abundant mercy, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord, you sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but upon the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. You and Sister Sheila are the two parochial administ pastoral administrators, right? Yes. The two roses among the thorns. <laughs> God bless you. Behold the Lamb of God. 
Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be here.
body of Christ.
Before our final prayer, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to Right Reverend Father Abbot de Sousa for your presence here tonight and for all the prayers of our diocese that your community at the Abbey of the Genesee presents to our dear Lord. Certainly to my brother priests, our deacons, for being here in such great numbers who are true support to all of our pastors, to our wonderful service, to our outstanding choir and instrumentalists under the direction of Mr. John Marabito, to the ushers, to the lectors, to all who contributed in any way to such a solemn and beautiful celebration, to the Knights and Ladies of the Holy Sepulchre, to the Knights of Columbus, to Father Van Lieshout, the Rector of the Cathedral, and to Father White, who is our Director for Diocesan Ceremonies. And a great, deep word of gratitude to those of you, my sisters and brothers, who make up the Diocese of Rochester and contribute so much in ways probably known only to you and to God. But your presence tonight in such a wonderful grouping of the faithful is an outstanding support to those of us in holy orders and in ministry. We count upon you. You might notice that in every pastoral visit I make, I always visit the kitchen after the, before the reception. I go to see those hardworking people washing the pots and pans, leaning over hot stoves, working so hard. They don't have glamorous titles, but you, can you imagine what a flop the reception would be if they didn't show up? And so to all, in so many different ways, who contribute to the life of this beautiful diocese of Rochester. Let us pray. We beseech you, almighty God, that those you renew by your sacraments may merit to become the pleasing fragrance of Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth. The Mass is ended. Amen. And I do want to thank our two pastoral administrators, Deacon Patron and to Sister Shirley Stevenson who both do such wonderful work in their respective parishes and contribute also so greatly to the life of our diocese.
they still say that God bless. You're feeling very well. You're feeling God bless you. So happy to see you. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Bona Pasqua Anche Lei.